Ja. Ja. Auf der Bühne. Ja. 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 On uh, a very important fact in our, in our area, with the uh, influence uh, of of a sort of septic tanks, but they all uh, describe the whole thing and go through the presentation for us. So welcome, Gary. Thank you very much. Eric will come up a little bit later. Yes. Good. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Brown. I'm an independent uh, water practitioner, to call it that I suppose. I'm a civil engineer by trade and have uh, over the last 20 to 30 odd years been involved in, in the water and wastewater sector in South Africa uh, with a big focus on small wastewater treatment applications. And uh, I'm very pleased to share some of my knowledge with you guys this afternoon in terms of fundamental water and wastewater, wastewater treatment practices. We'll go through a couple of slides on that. And then I'll share some of the technical aspects associated with these new products that are arriving in our market, which I think from a wastewater practice point of view makes sense to consider for your application. And hopefully you'll be able to uh, tie the two together in terms of my presentation and some of the technology uh, features that we will share with you guys. I think there'll be a question and answer section afterwards. Yep. So uh, I'm going to jump straight in and just start introducing the concept of sewage to you guys. And if you understand what what sewage is relative to wastewater, to relative to sewerage, and relative to sewage, uh, because they're fundamentally different, but they're all associated. So I like to use mind maps or word clouds to capture that information. And hopefully you can start picking out some words there in terms of um, what you can relate to in terms of sewage and, and or wastewater treatment. I also want to share some history with you and we can go back quite a bit in time to when um, sewage treatment really came about. And, and yes, there was early days when there were very few of us on this planet and so um, when we were starting to be impacted by our waste that we generated, we simply packed up and moved. And those were the early settlement days and the nomadic times when we were, could do that. Later on in life when we became more, we soon realized that we couldn't live within our waste and therefore formalized and dedicated uh, structures and designs uh, were developed. The Romans were pretty good at that. I think it's well understood and well documented that the Romans have been pretty good at water conveyance. From a sewage treatment point of view, um, trickling filters were developed in the 1892s, 93s. Um, so we still use them today in, in very much the same format. The other type of process that I'll touch on is activated sludge, and that was first developed in the UK in 1914. And so that's very much the processes that we still are familiar with today and we use. Um, and there's been some refinement of that over time uh, and more recently, the focus is really on trying to consolidate on those footprints to optimize energy requirements because we're short of energy as well um, and to see how best we can get a water quality that we can reuse and reapply to counter uh, the reduction in natural water resource. And recently, there's been a, a return of interest into anaerobic digestion processes, not really applicable for small wastewater people systems but certainly for the larger municipal ones where we started that in the early 1900s so we almost back and do the complete cycle of that in terms of focusing on on some of that so what is sewage where does it come from <laughs> <laughs> yeah every morning we can sit and contemplate that I suppose so definitely from toilets and urine or flushings uh, we like to call that black water um, associated with that are discharges from our baths, from our showers um, and from hand basin drainage areas. We collect that into the same sewer that we go to the sewage plant. We also collect or allow the chicken, sorry, the kitchen waste 
drains to, to discharge into the same uh, pipe. Um, but we don't want to encourage excessive fats to, to enter the process because fats have got a high organic content which has an impact on the actual biological process and I'll touch on a little bit later. We do allow laundries as well um, and so that really ties up everything. For small developments that you guys might be directly involved in or game lodges or hotels and the like, please know cool backwash. Uh, that's got a high chlorine content, it's got a high um, inert material in it, and, and that's not food for the bacteria. So it will just occupy some of your hydraulic uh, loading rates and constraints and therefore put pressure on your treatment process. So this sewage is conveyed in a series of sewers, pipes and channels, um, and the sewage reticulation comprises a network of, of sewers and pump stations. And so we end up heading towards our proverbial black box. Um, so what is the black box? What is the, the official formal term for it? I'm going to ask you one or two little quizzes. Um, that's part of uh, maybe trying to get you to encourage you to get your CPD points up. So what do we call this? Is it a sewer treatment plant, a sewerage treatment plant, or a sewage treatment plant? If you had taken note of the words I was using earlier, you would notice that it's a sewage treatment plant. We convey sewage in a sewer, which is a pipe, and that's an associated sewer reach reticulation. So there it is there. Okay, so that's some of that. What is in the actual sewage? What do we convey in the pipe? Let's think about that. And while you're thinking of maybe five contents, let's just remind you what they could be. So we're going to have water, right? Because we need the water to flush. Um, these days, flushing mechanisms are being criticized a lot by competitive type technologies, but it's an important, uh, unfortunately an, an important aspect, we need to convey the waste. So when we start converting to low flush toilet systems in a reticulation that's existing, remember that reticulation might be designed to have a certain gradient to convey the uh, hydraulic contents. And if you reduce that hydraulic load, you're not going to allow the material to flow in that pipe anymore because the gradient is not steep enough to allow a lower flow in it and so you get blockages in your pipes. We have um, gases as well, as well as heavy metals. Um, we're going to find microorganisms. Uh, so those are not just bacteria, but a whole plethora of, of microscopic uh, uh, organisms that are around in the waste. Um, some of them are good guys and some of them are bad guys. The bad guys are the pathogenic bacteria. They're the ones that can cause and form bacteria uh, cholera, typhoid, hepatitis, and gastroenteritis and things like that. Um, and they're bacteria, viruses, and parasites. So recently the Water Research Commission has just done a, a study on tracking the COVID virus in wastewater treatment to try and identify areas where COVID was uh, prevalent. And that's been quite successful. We have dissolved salts as well. So dissolved salts would be your calciums, magnesiums, uh, chlorides, etc, etc. And we have suspended solids. The suspended solids might be different in its format. So grit, sand, sand from washing clothes, from washing your body, from wind blowing into the system, from sand getting into the reticulation, would all end up at the sewage treatment plant along with other debris that we don't really want in there, but it's classified as uh, suspended solids, non-biodegradable. So non-biodegradable means it's not, uh, it's not food for the bacteria. The bacteria can't break it down, they can't oxidize it. The biodegradable material, that's the food for the bacteria, typically measured as a carbon organic fraction, and that's either measured as uh, what we call COD, chemical oxygen demand, or BOD, biochemical oxygen demand. And as the words um, suggest, it's a measure of how much oxygen is required to break those, uh, that's associated with the oxidizing of those materials, the carbon fractions. Fats, oils and grease, I alluded to that earlier, are high in uh, organic material and so we don't want to overload a system by not uh, applying good fat trap uh, practices. The nutrient fraction is another component that's quite important. Typically uh, nitrogen we find, mostly ammonia. In the, uh, in the wastewater and we also find phosphate. As you can probably associate, 
nitrogen and, and, and phosphate are nutrients and so we need to remove them out of the discharge into, into the rivers otherwise we have eutrophication, that's the excessive growth of algae and we have problems that you have in some of the dams around South Africa where we find the eutrophication. Household cleaning agents are a big challenge. Sanitizers, blood, uh, milk, dairy, brewery, effluent and things like that are all high in organic strength. And so we don't encourage the discharge of that into a municipal or domestic sewage treatment plant. We normally ask if it's an industry to uh, pre-treat their discharge so that it can meet a standard that will be suitable for discharge into the sewer. If we don't allow that, then we can have impacts in terms of the performance of the plant. So, here's a classic example just for your knowledge. I don't expect you guys to remember all of this right up front. But pH, which is a simple physical parameter that we like to keep an eye on because it has an impact on the bacteria, shouldn't, from a process point of view, be low 6.8 and shouldn't be about 7.8. That's the, the process control value that we propose and recommend in practice. And if you look at the regulation, the general limit in the general authorization as written in the National Water Act is saying between 5.5 and 9.5. I can tell you that if you're running your process at a pH of 5.5 or 5.6, which is about the limit or within the limit, you're still not going to have any bacteria activity because they're not going to be happy at anything below 6.8. So there's a bit of a, a trade-off between understanding the process side of things and interpreting that with what you would just look at out of the Water Act in terms of the general limits. So be mindful of that. There's a couple of other parameters as well. So to put the pH in perspective, just to add some, some light to me going on about sewage, what do you think the pH levels of these parameters could be? We drink Coca-Cola, right? We drink coffee, we don't really drink household cleaners. Um, the only thing that we're not going to recommend if you look at the next scale is, uh, is battery acid. And, and this is why. There's your stomach acid. That's at a pH of 1. So that's inside your stomach. That's the pH of your, of your, of your activities in your stomach. It's pretty low, it's very acidic. And that's required so that you can metabolize and break down most things that we eat. And the only thing beyond that is battery acid. So the term of this tastes like battery acid or whatever, that's probably the association. Look at Coca-Cola, 2.5. Tomato juice, 4. Um, where was red wine? It's in here somewhere. Can you find it? Coffee, five. So they're all low pH. Look at the high pH stuff. A lot of the cleaning agents are very alkaline in their uh, makeup and solution. And that also has an impact. Remember the ideal 6.8 to, to 7.8? If we have a hair salon activity discharged straight into a sewer, which goes straight into a small package plant, you can expect a big impact on the bacteria. They don't like that high pH and so your process won't work. So be mindful when you assemble a, a wastewater treatment plant, particularly in small environments, in a shopping mall set, uh, environment, to understand the activities. And so you can ask those activities to pre-treat or to dilute the water when they discharge it so that we don't have these high strength shock loads coming into the wastewater plant. We get away with it in a big municipal environment because you can appreciate that there's a series of reticulation out in a city and so that impact of one hair salon is going to be small if, if, if at all of any impact because of the dilution of the rest of the water. But in a shopping centre or a home, a home uh, hair salon, I'm, I'm not picking on hair salons, it's just a good example, it's in my mind right now, but if it's in a residential estate and work from home these days, Home is encouraging that, and you may set up a hair salon at home, and you may have a small sewage plant in your residential estate, and that activity could have an impact on, on the performance of the bacteria, and hence the final effluent quality. So this maybe brings you to the point of to ponder about why do we treat sewage? Why can't we just do that? Straight to the river. I don't know if you can see that how clear it is, but that's a water hole 
that's receiving partially treated sewage. And do you see any animals around that? No. So that's not encouraging any sort of uh, pro-environmental activity around that water hole. The animals will be sensitive to that and they won't even bother coming down to drink it, etc, etc. And so that's why we have controls in terms of that. And that's why we should be considering dedi dedicating a sewage treatment plant to uh, receive this water and produce uh, something that's, that's of a better quality that we can apply. The sewage treatment plant, and I'll touch on this again, is a fundamental, uh, the fundamental property around sewage treatment is the separation of solids and liquids, and so you end up with two products. Don't forget about the solids component. Any water treatment facility, whether it's a drinking water plant, a sewage treatment plant, or an industrial water treatment plant, would end up with two products. But you can treat that treated the effluent, the incoming water, to a reasonable standard that you can then get the benefit out of at the end of the day, even if it might be a small package type plant. So, I'm not sure if this is going to work. No. So why, why treat the sewage? Let's just go through that again quickly. Um, untreated uh, wastewater will contain high organics. And this is the impact that you can see if you have high organics in the water, you're going to remove that natural occurring dissolved oxygen in the river and typically you have fish dying off and so when you're reading the paper about fish kills you can associate that with um, partially treated or untreated sewage getting into the natural river systems and having this impact or producing quite a lot of bad smell at the same time so that bad smell becomes a nuisance and that nuisance attracts flies and other disease carrying uh, animals and, and insects and would spread disease uh, quite, uh, quite rapidly and, and have an impact on us as human beings. And so these guys carry uh, all these diseases that could impact on you. Putting up a sign isn't responsible enough, I'm afraid. I mentioned the nutrient levels, um, high nutrient levels will promote this eutrophication as the growth of algae and aquatic weeds and, and that certainly has a significant impact if uh, any of you have gone past Hartigius Burg Dam up in, uh, near Brooks in, in just west of Johannesburg, northwest of Johannesburg, uh, you would see that quite a lot. There's the dam itself and this is all algae blooms on there. This is not out of the sewer. This is out of a eutrophified <laughs> river and this crop is, is just covered in, in algae. Some of the algae is toxic, we get blue-green algae strains and so if human beings or animals drink or come into contact with that they can pick up serious skin um, diseases or even it could be uh, lethal to us. I mentioned the bad guys, that's the pathogenic bacteria and they can get into our system through ingestion and uh, make us really sick. Look at this, one gram of feces typically contains 10 million viruses, 1 million bacteria, a couple of, well a thousand odd parasite cysts and a couple of parasite eggs. So it's not just bacteria but it's the Ascaris eggs from the roundworm um, and this is the roundworm cycle. There it is there. So we pass the, the roundworm eggs in, in our feces or in the organic solids that come out of the wastewater treatment plant. We use that solid in the garden at home, gets under our fingernails, we don't wash our hands, we come inside and eat and we swallow the eggs and then the worms grow in our bodies, in our stomachs. It's not all doom and gloom though, so I'm not the prophet of doom hopefully. And um, so there's opportunities to apply ourselves for reuse. I think we all now understand and appreciate and accept and acknowledge that South Africa is a water scarce country. I think Cape Town's Day Zero reminded us of that. And so I've jumped a slide, I apologize. So for us to apply ourselves, um,
we apply ourselves correctly, we can use the effluent to mitigate water conservation, water demand management. I'm not suggesting we should go and drink our, our wastewater right now. There's no need for that. That technology is around, but it's very expensive. But we can start applying it for reuse and rather use treated effluent in areas where we're drinking fresh water resources for the same application. So gardening, flushing of toilets, uh, uh, irrigation, etc., etc., car wash, and the likes are, are quite easily um, utilized by applying uh, effluent, uh, treated effluent to it. And then, of course, if we don't really want to um, respond to, to that, there is not only that social responsibility by us in the water sector to provide um, sustainable solutions in terms of wastewater treatment, there is, in fact, a legal requirement as well. And that's embedded in the National Water Act of South Africa and that specifies uh, uh, certain uh, conditions that you need to follow. <laughs> and we have got the National Department of, of Water and Sanitation, that is the regulator. They impose, um, they can impose strict penalties on non-compliance of that. And so that you should be using as your reference. You don't want to get onto the wrong side of the law. You can notice there that blue scorpions are everywhere these days and they certainly are quite active. Okay, so the fundamental principle, like I was saying, is the separation of solids and liquids. That's what we're going to do. We can do it with industrial water, we can do it with drinking water, we can do it with very nasty looking uh, industrial water. That's a textile, look at it coming out of the factory pink. We can do that with it. And then sewage treatment. So it's all the same at the end of the day, water treatment, separation of solids and liquids. How do we do that in a biological treatment process? Well, it's quite easy. That's what we do. We don't do anything. These are the guys that are doing the work. They are the bacteria and the other microorganisms that are in the process. They occur naturally. All we do in this black box is allowing the wastewater to arrive in there we then size and design that wastewater treatment plant accordingly and allow these guys to do their job. And if they do their job properly and if we provide the right size and we operate and maintain the facility adequately, we're going to get a treated water that we are targeting. So don't forget what I said. So there is a solids component that comes out of that as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have different kinds of bacteria and, and organisms. These ones are all protozoa. And you can see some of them attach themselves onto the substrate. Remember, these are all magnified a hundred times. We can't see them with the naked eye. We have to look under the microscope to appreciate what they're doing. And so from a wastewater practice point of view, sometimes we encourage to take a drop of water and put it on a slide and put it under a microscope, magnify it a hundred times and see what you can see. And if your process is active and happy, you should be seeing things like this. Because that's all happy uh, organisms that are, are busy working away at, at cleaning the water. So it doesn't matter if it's small or large. The same principle, it's the same bacteria. Right? So, so bear that in mind. There's nothing different to a large-scale municipal wastewater treatment plant in a small package plant that you might have in a, in a golf estate. <coughs> the critical thing is to ensure that we provide enough oxygen for the bacteria. Aerobic conditions are key. And they have to be maintained and sustained in the process. Just to quickly go through the biology. So in essence, the bacteria can be divided into two um, types or two uh, families, the heterotrophs and autotrophs. The heterotrophic bacteria um, are, are organisms that are characterized by feeding mainly on organic carbon molecules rather than inorganic ones. Heterotrophic, organic carbon. That's all I want you to try and remember. I'm not making you into an expert. But the other group, the autotrophs, will take up inorganic chemicals and use these uh, to break down or feed on the organic compound. And so the very important one from a sewage treatment point of view, remember I mentioned ammonia in the water. These bacteria can nitrify the ammonia that converted to nitrates. And we have some more that then convert the nitrates to nitrogen gas and therefore control the total nitrate in the plant. <clears throat> it's maybe a bit easier than what I'm, I'm making it out to be, and to remind us 
That's just some of the chemical reactions that still take place. There is chemistry associated with the biology. And so these are the types of different bacteria that function in a wastewater treatment plant typically. And if you have come across a wastewater treatment plant, you should be familiar with some of these processes that, that we find. You can start associating with aerobic, anaerobic, and facultative uh, conditions. Um, aerobic, obviously you need available oxygen. Anaerobic, no oxygen available. Those bacteria don't need oxygen. And facultative are really indifferent. So if there's readily available oxygen, they'll access that. If there's oxygen associated with a compound, they'll access that. And so they can break that down. Typically those denitrified dimensions that are there, and so do the uh, phosphate removing bacteria. <coughs> and then of course to remember that the protozoa, which is the next order up from the bacteria, would feed on those bacteria. So they are very important in filtering the effluent out. There's a whole regime of different processes that one can encounter these days in terms of biological treatment processes. And from an aerobic point of view, you can get two types. The fixed form, which I mentioned, was started in 1893 with tripping filters. Obviously, that's developed over time. And so there's a couple of other types of technology configurations around, all based on fixed film or attached growth process. That means that the bacteria need a surface to grow on. They find that surface themselves and they grow on it. The other process that was developed was called activated sludge, also known as suspended solids, or suspended growth, sorry, uh, processes, and there's a couple of them around as well. Mostly for larger municipal plants, a lot more effective than those. Um, I'm going to just run through them very quickly, but we mustn't forget about on-site sanitation challenges. By and large, that's all I'm going to say about it today. I believe it's totally inadequate and, and not acceptable as a temporary measure, yes, but our temporary measures are becoming permanent measures uh, in South Africa. <clears throat> so to recap on the fundamentals, separation of liquids and solids, two different process streams at the end of the day, one to treat the liquids, one to treat the solids, we end up with two different products. Uh, it's a natural biological process, so we don't need to add too much to it. In fact, very little, if any, chemical addition is required to the biological treatment process. We may need to add a chemical for disinfections. The chlorine is a very common chemical we use for final stage uh, disinfection. So it's really just the presence of this large number, and I'm talking millions of bacteria, that uh, are able to function under these different conditions to produce different results that we then control in the sewage treatment plant. And so it's very important to, to understand that and to apply that and to control that to make sure that the process works well. We're going to have different process stages to affect that as well. So we'll go through that uh, very briefly now. So this is the conventional municipal wastewater treatment work. It looks quite intimidating with all these process stages. Um, and in essence, we have preliminary treatment, we have primary treatment, we have secondary treatment, tertiary, and then we end up managing the solids as well. <clears throat> so that's basically an indication of where you find preliminary, primary, secondary, tertiary stage. So disinfection is a tertiary stage, and then the sludge handling. The challenge, of course, is how do we compact that into a small package type plant? So from a process treatment point of view, preliminary treatment is really around screens, removing on both biodegradable material. Flow measurement is important. We need to be able to measure what we designed against what we, what's actually coming in. If we allow too much water to come into the plant, obviously we're going to have problems in terms of capacity. And so flow measurement is quite important. Primary treatment is really a stage where we want to reduce some of the organic load that's coming into the plant. So from a small treatment perspective, septic tanks are, are, are primary, septic tanks are primary phase uh, processes where they just to reduce some of the organics. And so on the septic tank, which I thought we would chat a little bit further on because it's quite key in small package type plants, we're going to find three distinct layers forming in a septic tank. The scum will flow to the surface and that will contain some fats and other material that's not that's, uh, biodegradable will tend to float on the top, plastics and, and the rice. We then end up with the liquid zone and the sludge will start settling in the bottom. 
there's going to be a need to empty the septic tank over time, so you need to plan and, and include for desludging of your septic tank because the rate of digestion of the anaerobic bacteria on the settled sludge is lower than the rate of accumulation. And so we end up with an over accumulation of organic material which needs to physically be removed over time. Um, I'm not going to go through that, I'm trying to speed up because I suspect I'm a bit behind time. And so septic tanks can be applied in larger than single house uh, applications as well. And so you need to consider that in your application. And on the next slide I can share with you a quick calculation which you can find in a lot of the Water Institute of South Africa's design references as well as the Water Research Commission. Um, but it's really considering if you want to work out the volume of, of the septic tank, what the flow rate is, contribution per person, how many years of desludging you want to plan for, and the contributing uh, number of people or population. And so if you put that through that calculation with those uh, references to the units, you're going to get a volume in cubic meters. And that's what septic tanks do, a septic tank and a soak away. So you have a septic tank and you have a soak away. And if you do that correctly, it will work. Um, if you don't do it correctly, you're going to have real problems on your hand because uh, pathogens are coming through your septic tank. We don't remove pathogens there. It's a tertiary stage, remember, disinfection. And so you can start contaminating groundwater. We often find nitrates associated with groundwater pollution from sanitation. Remember, there's oxygen in, this, in the soil doesn't have to be a readily available atmosphere that you and I are breathing, although the bugs like that. But they can access the oxygen that's in the soil as well, and so they can nitrify the ammonia that's coming through here in the soil as well. And that's why we find nitrates uh, in, in groundwater associated with uh, soap waves. And so, we just have a quick representation of that. That's just to remind you, by the way, that water caps are quite important vent pipes are quite important so please don't uh, get that wrong when you do residential estate developments or commercial sites like where we are today um, because that prevents the odor from this being venting back into the house that's why we've got the vent pipe there and that's why we've got the water trap please remember that anyways to get on with our, our septic tank application we need to understand the soil conditions we need to understand the percolation rate, how much water will that soil allow to pass through it? Because that's got to match what's coming in. So what comes in here needs to go out as well. Because if it can't go out here, where's it going to go? It's going to come up to the surface, right? And so in this scenario, we've got a typical groundwater borehole supply in this community with the water, and we've got great access to waterborne sewage, and so we can put in flush toilets in the houses, people don't have to go outside and use pit latrines in the middle of the night, etc, etc. And so we have a septic tank and a soak away and we can start using it, we flush away happily, we can sit in the morning and contemplate life. And so what you're going to start realizing or seeing is this pollution bloom, we call it. Below surface, because we've managed to get our soak away designed adequately and correctly. If we're not mindful though of the septic tank and doing the maintenance, that could lead to failure of the soak away. If we're not mindful of the practical or the design limitations, this will fail. And so what happens when that fails? Well, let's just have a look at this little uh, graphic that I've, that I've drawn up. If it can't soak down, where's it going to go? Up, right? And so what happens? It starts ponding, or what we call blinding, on your soak away area. And because you now got anaerobic water partially treated sewage there, that's going to attract all the nuisances because it's going to smell. So you can have flies and mosquitoes and, and all the rest and your neighbors up and down as well, I guess. We also must be mindful of the fact that if it can't go there and it can't go there, it's going to start backing up, back up the pipes. And so your septic tank could fill up and start overflowing as well. And I see that quite often. Of course, we've got to be mindful of the groundwater level. Down on the coastal regions, we know that the, that the um, sea sand is readily uh, transportable and moisture, so the water can move through it quite quickly. And if you've got elevated ground levels and septic tank soakways in some of these coastal regions, 
and the holiday resort areas, you get to contaminating groundwater. There's very little doubt about that. And so this happens. So just as a quick scenario, he has two applications where we've got two neighbours and they've drilled into the groundwater. If, you, if you're not familiar with groundwater structures, you get various kinds of aquifers below the surface, different water bearing structures. And some of them are impermeable, so there's very little water or doesn't allow water, so it creates a barrier. And you've got some, what we call, unconfined aquifers that sit above these impermeable lakes. So there's nothing preventing that from us accessing where this one is protected because it's got this impermeable layer. So both examples have got uh, septic tanks and soak and there's the pollution plumes I've just spoken about and both of them have got boreholes. This guy drilled and he found water, he hit the unconfined aquifer and he said to his drilling guy, stop, equip my borehole, thank you very much, I've hit water and I'm happy. This guy carried on drilling and they hit this water and he said, no, no, carry on, I've got a bit of extra budget. And so he drilled further, and then he, that water dried up in his drilling program. This neighbour started smiling at him and said, oh, you should have stopped when I stopped because I've already got water and you're still busy drilling for water. But he continued because he had a bit more knowledge that he had prepared and he knew that there was further water below that. And so he drilled further, cost him a little bit more, but he found that water and he equipped his borehole. And so, at the end of the day, who's going to end up with the contaminated groundwater? Any guesses from the audience? The shallow one. The shallow one. Correct. Why? That's why. Can you see that? So his contamination has got into the unconfined aquifer, the same spot where his borehole is. This guy is being protected by this impermeable layer. So this is the secondary treatment aspect, attached growth I was talking about. It could be trickling filters uh, that are filled with rocks. It could be filled with plastic media of various shapes and sizes. It could be discs that are provided. Remember, for trickling filter attached growth processes, we need surface area for the bacteria to attach them on, onto. Activated sludge or suspended growth, the bacteria growing in suspension. We don't need to put plastic or rocks or anything in the reactors. And so we just have a reactor. But we can't just have the reactor, we need to now mix the content so that the bacteria and the food can come into contact. So there's an energy, an additional energy requirement. Um, we also need to put oxygen into them. The, the bacteria growing on stones, the air will move through the stones. If they're growing on the discs, the bacteria will move in and out of the water that are, because they're growing on the discs and the discs move in and out of the water because the, the, the discs are partially submerged in the water. So when they move out the water, they're exposed to the atmosphere and they can, they can breathe and absorb oxygen. They move back into the water and they dissolve that oxygen into the water and they can oxidize the nutrients and the organics. In activated sludge, we need to put the air in. We've got to transfer it from the atmosphere into there and we do that with aerators. And so there could be surface mounted aerators, I don't know how great the image is, but that's, that's an indication of what they are, they have discs that, that are uh, mounted on a, on a support structure, and they sit just below the surface of the water, and they rotate at a relatively high speed, and by doing that, they pick the water up in the basin, and they tend to do this, so they're mixing as well as um, aerating the water. If you don't have surface mounted stuff, so you might go to an activated sludge plant and not see surface mounted aerators, but you just see the water boiling or cooking, um, they've probably got, or they will have, um, diffused air, so that's a uh, diffuser sitting at the bottom of the basin, and that water's uh, uh, pumped into, into their through blowers typically. And so that diffused air is then forced into the water. So that's the big difference, those are stones, you get plastic medias, you get discs, all associated with, with fixed form or biological filtration processes, and they have activated stage. That's a quick comparison of the two, um, and there's a couple of, of, of elements. Bottom line is activated sludge can produce a better final equipment quality, but it requires more operational input and control. Um, you need to manage your food to microorganism ratio closely, because you have to remove some of the material that's growing in suspension. Physically, you have to remove that out of the process. An attached growth of fixed form processes doesn't produce as much sludge, 
because the material is growing on the, on the media. And so a little bit breaks off from that and that you secondary settle and then you can put that into your septic tank. On larger plants with larger volumes, you need to have uh, anaerobic digesters to stabilize that. Oxidation ponds could be another type of treatment process. I haven't got time to go into that now, I'm running out of time. Um, and biological nutrient removal systems are typically associated with activated sludge, where you can remove those nitrates. Like I mentioned before, disinfection is a typical tertiary treatment stage where you can kill off the pathogens by applying chlorine or other disinfecting agents. It doesn't have to be chlorine, it could be UV, it could be bromine, um, and other types of, of chlorine compounds. The ultraviolet is another one. The sludge handling aspect, like I said, typically on small systems, we can just get a mobile tank in to remove that and take it to a municipal plant that's got dedicated sludge handling facilities, and they will should receive your sludge and be able to treat it effectively through this uh, suggested line. So, can we can we do this? Um, can we downscale that municipal plant to a small package plant? The answer is yes, you can. Uh, because the fundamentals are still the same. But you need to still understand those fundamentals, you need to apply them, you still need to design them. The challenge is how small can you make it? How many can you make something and it's still, it can still work? Well, you've still got the critical mass that it will work. And, and that's often the challenge with package type plants. So it doesn't matter what shape or size it takes, it will work if it's correctly designed, if it's operated and maintained uh, adequately and you understand the process. So take, take some time to, to understand that or find someone that can help you do that. There are a couple of, of wastewater practitioners around that can assist you with this sort of thing. So you can go from that and try and mitigate all your red by simply applying a, a, a tertiary or secondary treatment process uh, and, and in this instance, what we're going to talk about very briefly is the bio rock and the, and the bio rotor, the rotating biological contactor process that uh, bio rock have developed. And by doing that, uh, you mitigate all the reds that we showed earlier associated with septic tanks and soakaways. So, secondary treatment from an existing septic tank soakaway point of view, in my opinion, is very viable because you're now producing options in terms of how you can apply that, that effluent and not go and contaminate groundwater. This remains uh, safe and free. Of course, it can also be discharged into, into the environment if you want to. So the BioRock process um, is a fixed film process and the BioRotor process is also a fixed film process based on the RBC uh, application uh, the BIROC is based on a tricky filter type of application and I quickly just want to run through some of that with you guys. So there's been some improvement and advancements in the application of media since the 1893 start date where we used rocks. Um, we very soon realized that rocks had to be of a certain size and shape with a certain grading and, 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 and ability to allow oxygen to move through it and to allow um, the wastewater to trickle through it as well allow the surplus bacteria that, that grow on there to slough off and, and slip through the openings that need collected for, for tertiary treatment. So we applied plastic media. Plastic media has is, is, is got inside cavities that provide additional surface area. So you've got more surface area per, per volume than you have with stones, discs and other types of plastic media. The bar rock is applying a very fine media bag that's got a uh, microscopic openings in it. Remember we're dealing with, with microorganisms and so there's a tremendous interface of um, surface area for the bacteria to accumulate and colonize on. And so septic tanks we use quite a bit. There's opportunity to improve on that. As I mentioned the uh, bio products are a great add-on to, to a septic tank and you can start achieving and mitigating those red paths that I, I was alluding to earlier. You can get to improve the quality of the water because you're now adding an aerobic stage to an anaerobic septic tank. Remember, septic tank is only anaerobic and so it's limited in terms of the effluent quality that it can produce. The Ecorock range comes in various shapes and sizes and is associated with all of those discharge points that I mentioned in, uh, in the build-up to this uh, discussion. 
The key feature here is to create a draft to suck air through the process. You can see it in these white lines. And so there's a requirement to have a dedicated stack with a ventilator on it to enable this draft and to pull the air through the viral. This is just the septic tank or primary phase component associated with that. Remember, we still want to do that because we can remove 30 odd percent of the organics through that. And so we've got different models for different sizes. We can um, start uh, applying them in parallel to increase treatment capacity. And very simply, that's the water flow through there. So what you see there is the septic tank, and yeah, you see the, uh, the bar rock and this downward flow, the irrigation of the effluent through a launder to ensure that there's equal distribution, and that simply trickles through the media bags, the bacteria establish on there. And if the conditions are right, if the airflow is right, and if the load is right, the pH is right, it'll work. There's no reason why it shouldn't work, they do work, and uh, they are around, uh, uh, there's quite a number of them around globally, I think there's 80 odd thousand installations around the world. So these red dots are just pointing out key components, which I'm not going to go into now. Uh, we're welcome to engage with Eric later in terms of the technicalities and, and the features of, of that bar of curve. The second process, very briefly, is the rotating biological contactor. So those are the discs that are associated on the shaft. Um, and very simply, they um, can receive a septic tank water. And we have a, a series of rotating discs. They access the oxygen from the atmosphere as that rotating disc moves in and out of the basin. We have a secondary sediment tank downstream of that to collect the material, the excess organic material that falls off the disc and we settle that out. That clean water is then suitable to discharge. We will still disinfect that just to remove the pathogens because they don't get removed. The bacteria don't eat the pathogens. We have to uh, disinfect them in some way or another. Of course, like I've been saying, there's an interface with sludge, and so the material that's settling in the secondary settlement tank, we return to the septic tank quite simply. So we create and provide for some sludge accumulation in the septic tank, and at least once a year, or whatever you design your interval, remember that equation I shared with you, will allow what cycle you need to do to get a mobile tanker to come along and withdraw the sludge. And when you do that, please make sure that they withdraw the sludge and not the water out of the tank, because it's a sludge that needs to move. Remember, the water line is going this way. That's a fundamental principle. We separate solids and liquids. The solids are going this way, and so the solids exit out there. This is the concept behind the RPC. So we have material grain on the, on the discs. That material gets bigger and bigger and breaks off eventually and gets renewed and replaced with a new growth of bacteria as long as it's getting food, as long as it's turning. It will stay fairly consistent in its, uh, in its nature. What's quite important is to make sure that the spacing between the discs is uh, well, well positioned so that we don't get bridging of material between there because then you start losing surface area, you start losing air transfer efficiencies, etc. etc. They're applicable particularly in fluctuating loads because it stays in the basin, it's ideal for hotels, holiday homes, uh, schools, clinics, hospitals where you have fluctuating loads, etc. And that's really what the bio rotor is all about. And I just quickly want to whiz through some of the key features, I've got a little bit of time to still run. Um, associated with this relative to some of the older types of RBC configurations that are around uh, commercially. Because there are some, some challenges with them that have had a negative impact on RBCs in the market. Um, and so just take note of some of these uh, features that we've, we've listed here, and we'll go through them individually. So the RBC rotors, the discs have to be covered. Uh, they need to be protected from the UV sunlight because UV is a disinfectant and they could shine on the discs and kill off the bacteria that we're trying to grow on the discs. So there should be a cover of some form provided. That cover ideally should be movable or have the ability to give you access to still be able to see and inspect what's going on inside of the RBC column. Um, and so what the biorotor have done is provide a very simple, lightweight, molded uh, lids that are easily lifted um, to gain that access. 
And so you don't end up in this sort of situation where you have very heavy type of covers that are very difficult to, um, to lift and remove so they don't get lifted and removed. And so you don't ever get to inspect until it fails and then you have to replace an entire rotor just because you can get access. Or it corrodes, the frame corrodes, and in the next big storm you lose not only your cover but your disc as well. The spacing I was talking about earlier is quite important to be able to provide enough gap between the two discs to allow for uh, to counter the bridging risk. And as you would increase your treatment efficiency through your train of RBCs or discs or rotor, you can adjust the spacing between the discs. And this is a key feature that allows the rotor makeup on a bio rotor to be optimized for its design. So you can start with a, a wider space disc and you can end up with reduction that typically follows the organic COD reduction. So they're all set at the dinner table, but the nitrophiles will only get a chance to eat once these guys with the COD oxidizers are had there too. You encounter that they do provide spaces and, and aren't just very quickly or very cheaply put together, and so you have problems with the process even though the rated capacity in terms of the surface area provided is adequate, but if your discs are touching, you're losing surface area. So too closely packed together, you're not going to have that air movement through, through the disc. Very important. So the discs themselves, um, the bio-rotor discs are, are fairly thin, they're 1.7 millimeters thick. Um, so you can put quite a few of them on a disc, on a shaft. Uh, to increase your treatment capacity. Like I was saying about the spacing, you've now got a choice of, of uh, 11, 15, and 17 millimeter spacing around there as well. Most RBCs have standardized on two meter diameter discs, and so retrofit options with this type of, of rotor is available, and I believe very attractive because of these key features that the bio rotor offers to existing RBC installations. So the integrity of the disc is also very important and you need to be able to ensure that it can sustain the pressures that, it's ex uh, that are exerted on it when it rotates in and out of the water. There's tremendous pressure in terms of the deflection when it hits the water surface and when it moves out. There's vertical and horizontal forces exerted on that entire rotor structure and so it has to be well compacted. The discs need to be in uh, of a... a an adequate quality to sustain those pressures and deflections. Otherwise you start losing chunks of the disc very quickly. The drive unit, um, there needs to be a mechanical component. We need something to turn the wheel, the, the rotor. Um, it's a very small energy requirement because that rotor needs to rotate very slowly. Between 1 and 5 RPM is the, um, the industry norm. The quicker it turns, the more aerobic it will be, but it obviously needs a little bit more energy. Um, and so the application is how do you optimize your energy requirement because we need to be sensitive regardless of what, what electrical consumption we're applying. The bio-rotor have looked at a, a, um, a ring gear drive, so they've got a, a ring that fits on the end of the last disc, and that's driven with a, a side-associated um, unit and so not fixed in the center, which is another key um, factor. Because the direct couple systems, where you have your hollow core shaft, gearbox interface, once that's uh, in place, we find it very difficult to take that gearbox off again to replace it or to take it in for some form of maintenance or repair. And unfortunately, and invariably, you end up having to cut the, the shaft and that compromises the integrity of the shaft when you re-weld it because as soon as you put heat back onto that shaft it's going to deflect and that typically deflects out of its tolerance and so when the rotor rotates it's now rotating uh, at an exaggerated tolerance and so it puts a lot more pressure on the bearings on the ends that are keeping it in place and so you have excessive bearing wear um, and in fact the shaft could continue deflecting to a point where it then fails because it will deflect on every rotation and eventually it will just sit on the bottom of the basin. There's only about a 200, 150 millimeter tolerance between the bottom of the RBC basin 
and the discs as they rotate through the bottom of it. And the reason for that is to ensure that there's no sludge that accumulates in the RPC basin. We want to move that up. So there's very little opportunity for sludge to accumulate in there. The shaft itself, as I was talking, uh, the biorotor shaft has been optimized in terms of its uh, length. They've um, engaged with quite a number of experienced RBC developers in Europe and they've optimized the length of the shaft. It's a stainless steel um, piece of equipment and so its integrity and its strength is, is guaranteed. And I think Eric can, can cover the guarantees on that. Because the last thing you want to do is spend money on a capital item and because there's a cheap shaft inside it doesn't last and you end up having to replace your rotor maybe more frequently than what you anticipated because of that in inferior quality uh, material or shaft that's uh, not adequately designed because uh, that's the, the bulk cost item in the system in any event further the bar rotor have added um, bailing buckets so that's enabling you to transfer liquid or wastewater out of the basin as this uh, disc rotates and therefore allow you to transfer liquid out of there without a pump. So that's working as the disc is rotating, it's bailing, it's picking up water in these buckets. When the bucket gets to the top, it discharges it through this connection trough and then out uh, through there. And you can effect a dedicated denitrification cycle, for example you're making nitrates in here which is now going to limit in terms of the general limits of South African standard and so you need to remove some of the nitrates. So all the RBCs that have been installed under the old Water Act requirements, there was no need for uh, denitrification or nitrate li uh, limits in the effluent standard and so many of them haven't got this feature and that's further motivation in terms of retrofit applications. It's very difficult to add these to an existing unit has to be done in the factory. You can't go and add this very quickly to a disc that you find in practice. Uh, it's, it's not that easy, believe me. I think one of the last things is the, the tank. The rotor molded tank is, is of a high strength. Um, the Biorock products started with the with the eco rocks and the monoblocks and are, are um, rotor molded. They're experts in rotor molding. That's where they started. They were an expert uh, rotor molding company and a wastewater company that got together. And so they rotor molded a unit that could apply their wastewater treatment technology. And so they've done the same uh, 15 years later on an RBC uh, basin as well. That's obviously got the UV stabilization in it. It's certainly got all the strength in terms of the structural uh, requirements for retaining that weight and, and integrity of the RBC and uh, there's quite a bit of guarantee associated with that because they're quite confident about it. Lastly, the, the secondary settlement, remember I mentioned that on the disc the bacteria grow and they fall off as the disc moves in and out of the water. Typically we apply uh, settling tanks through what we call Dortmund type or 60 degree cone tanks in Europe um, and what Biroc have done is, is develop the lamella settling tank a lot more aggressively for biological treatment processes. Remember the challenge is that the bacteria tend to grow on the, on the plates because it's a surface. But in an RBC there's very little sludge production and so you can achieve this uh, plate separating application quite readily. So instead of relying on, on the particles to drop 5-6 meters in a standard six, 60 degree cone tank because that's got quite a a deep vertical drop to it to affect the 60 degree cone you can put in plates and now the particles only going to drop a couple of millimeters it hits the plate the plates inclined at 60 degrees and so the sludge can slide down these plates and gets collected in the hopper for removal so that means you can have a lot more of this because that's affecting the settling rather than that and so the settling tank footprint becomes a lot smaller as well and so that completes the challenge in terms of making these packaging these things, making them smaller, optimizing the footprint in which they operate. And that's just a, a very quick uh, schematic of the lamella settling tank. I don't think it's that clear from where you guys are sitting and I'm not sure how clear it is on the screen. But those are, are the lamella packs. Uh, it's got an effluent launder and below it's got a sludge hopper 
with a pump that will remove the sludge and the treated water will decant and get discharged uh, under gravity. And so the biorotor has a simple configuration and it offers flexibility in its makeup. You can add units to it, so it's modular and you can end up with a number of biorotors to achieve whatever treatment capacity you require. And you can start applying this, which is a very, very important uh, feature for South Africa's effluent discharge criteria for larger wastewater treatment groups. I can't stop without reminding you about some of the basics we need to monitor, we need to apply, we need to understand these things. They can't operate on their own. Um, we often have this challenge of trying to make things as low maintenance as possible, with as little operational input and intervention as possible, but there are certain key parameters that you need to still uh, apply. Um, you need to make sure that that food to microbes and balance is retained. You need to make sure that your flow can flow through, there's no blockages. Uh, you need to make sure that the aerobic conditions remain unstable. You need to make sure you don't throw too many fat oils and greases down the drain, etc, etc. And if you do that little bit, you will find that uh, your process will work very well. And so we encourage you to do a little bit of, of data keeping because when you do phone me to ask me to come and help you troubleshoot, I'm going to say, well, what happened? Something's caused an upset or change in the environment that's affected the bacteria. And so if you've got some record of pH, of flow, power failures, little things like that, it certainly helps with um, troubleshooting and helping you to understand and ensure that your plant can continue and you can enjoy the, the benefits of getting the treated water that you can irrigate, you can put on your golf course, you can put in your water hole, you can put into your flushing system and save some water. So we need to remember all of this and so you're not alone, there are recommend, recommended guideline documents that the Water Research Commission has produced um, from an architectural point of view you can access these from the Water Research Commission's uh, website. You can go to their Knowledge Hub and download these documents. And I encourage you to do that because that's going to support your interface with your client when he takes ownership of your system that you've provided to him. Because it's the same with buying a motor car. It comes with a service manual. And so you need to have some reference. So when you talk to package plant suppliers, please make sure that they provide you with a decent operating manual with a decent reference and explanation uh, because there are some men out there that do that um, that are applying themselves. It might cost a little bit extra and so maybe not the cheapest solution is the best solution always. Um, thank you very much for your time and I think I'm just about on time. I don't know if Eric you want to say a couple of things or Maurice? There's, there's a couple of questions that came sure. through. Uh, do you want to deal with it now? Um, if they're relevant to this presentation, certainly. Uh, first question from Peter Brown. Uh, he asked, uh, when within a municipality area where you're not allowed to have a septic tank, for instance, how do you get by for pre-approval from the municipalities councils? Would you be able to do that? Yes, so, so municipalities have got bylaws and the bylaws would allow septic tanks as well or some form of, of on-site sanitation if they cannot guarantee and provide you with a waterborne system. Uh, and, and I think that's consistent with most municipalities. I'm not sure which area is referring to where they're not allowing septic tanks. Yeah. No, but there are yeah. septic tanks in this area, right? Yeah. 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 But yeah. not in a residential area. Also, they not septic tanks. One of your eco rock systems I installed here in Victoria Bay. Okay. Hmm. We'd love to go and have a look at it yeah. and see how well it's still working. Hmm. Someone has to look under the cover every once in a while. Yeah, it's about a year ago. Okay. Hmm. About a year ago. Yes. And a year ago I talked to you about Adam. Yes. And up in Park yes. as well. And yes. That was a new system. Correct. You mm -hmm. actually said you had yeah. a lot of people regarding that. Yeah. Oh. So Edo have just gone for a rotating biological contact process that's uh, that box specified. Yeah, we originally we recommended the mustang system. Yes. And then eventually they went to some 
something quite different because there's a system that was installed in one of the cab improvement. Correct. Mm -hmm. So they eventually went for that. But you're gonna find that that organizations would tend to want to stick with what they understand and know best as well. So it's very difficult to then go and offer an alternative. But to, to answer that, I hope that answered the question. Um, there should be bylaws uh, in your municipal structure that would allow you to engage with them on your alternate sewage disposal uh, practices. So Gideon de Hering is just asking the cost in maintaining the system and replacement by whom? So the costs are, are it depends on what you're talking about in terms of costs. Um, the bio-rock systems have got really very little mechanical component to it, so there's no maintenance cost really associated with that. Um, there would probably be a little cost for chlorine, so that's subject to the volume of water. You can work on 7 milligrams per litre of chlorine dosage, and remember if you're using calcium hypochlorite, only 6 to 7 percent of it is active, so you need to take that into consideration when you work out your total dosage relative to the inflow. So you can work out your total um, volume or quantity of chlorine that you need to dose per day or per week and therefore work out a cost for that. Um, the RBCs that BioRoto are using has got a 0.3 kilowatt motor, 0.35 kilowatt motor per drive uh, and that's the only and about a 0.5 kilowatt pump in the sludge tank if the system is configured where you cannot return the sludge and the gravity back to the septic tank. So it really depends on the configured system, depends on the site and what's allowed on site in terms of creating what we would like to call the best fit, which is cascading everything. So you're doing away with a lot of pumps if you can have the right fall or lay of the land to call it that, to affect that cascade effect. Um, another question is, is it system approved by the SABS? Um, no, the system is not approved by the SABS. Uh, the BIROC system is manufactured in Europe under the EU standards in terms of quality of material um, which will be very similar to our ISO standards for material. Um, I'm not 100% sure and Eric might be able to elaborate on that. But as far as I'm aware there's no SABS approval for wastewater treatment systems. Um, we as the Water Institute of South Africa have tried to engage with the market to find a standardising the body to standardize and, and authorize that. And we concluded that it's going to be a very costly exercise to achieve. And so we rather basing the approach on making sure that you use credible design criteria that would in theory be able to meet the standards. So you need to share your design criteria. And a lot of uh, municipalities are requiring a, a qualified or an experienced or registered professional to sign off on these things these days as well. So you may come across that as well. Just an assumption, uh, just to clarify, a question was asked earlier uh, regarding septic tanks and whether they are allowed and not, and municipal bylaws to that. I assume that the bylaws or monograph or whatever is more suitable where there is not access to existing municipal treatment facilities. Yeah. Uh, so if you don't have a septic tank, it's not going to be applicable to you, it's more to the area where there is no access to 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 municipal correct to their bulk infrastructure yeah. to an outfall sewer yeah. that you can connect to um, but even within town you may find industry are producing a waste water of a certain quantity and certain quality to get away from uh, which yeah. the municipality may not allow them to discharge yeah. so then that's what we call trade yeah, agreements. So agreements. Oh, no. and so that industry through the trade would be expected to achieve a certain standard so you have pre-treatment of industrial wastewater to a certain standard. Especially to penalties occurring because of uh, quality of, of, of discharge. Correct, so they would, they would specify a minimum quality that's required for the trade effort to allow that industry to discharge so it doesn't have an impact on the sewage treatment plant. Yeah. So, so things like blood, brewery waste, um, dairy waste, all those high strength organics are not good because they require more oxygen your municipal sewage plant or your small package sewage plant only designed for X amount of aeration transfer. And that's based on the raw sewage organic concentration. And so you, you shock load that and it's not going to work. So municipalities try and prevent that by having trade effluent agreements. So it's, a, it's an incentive based thing. They encourage industry to do that. And so they get some incentive by doing that as well. 
is a good scenario that I've been um, confronted by in the past. Typically on um, on Ethan from from dairy side, um, sludge wise. But you're sitting with high sludge content in their effluent, which is very low COD content, which causes very high uh, penalties at the municipality because they dump it into the municipal sector. Uh, where do you go to the, the sludge that will be accumulated by any of the school buses? So there's opportunities and technology that are developing to extract the energy content out of that organic sludge. Uh, it's got a high energy content in it or potential um, and if you digest that and if you apply that properly you can you can through the digestion process produce a whole lot of methane and that methane can then be converted to to either electricity through CHP a combined heat power gas engines or you can even consider if it's enough volume to compress the biomethane as an alternative to LPG for example. Um, so there are a few options associated with that as well. It's a bit more difficult on small scale, but small scale I would anticipate that municipalities will allow you to discharge a little bit of sludge. Large industry, large sludge concentrations, like farmers with, with massive sludges, probably not. But that's where the opportunity lies with them, to take that organic material and, and take the energy out of it, because it's sitting there. Now it's in it to, to landfill. Yeah, because our area we're not viable for for evaporation ponds. Correct. Takes up space. It costs money. It's taking up space. Mm. There's a requirement to put in plastic lining these days to prevent groundwater. So it's costing these days. Um, mm -hmm. The the Western Cape government have announced that they are banning organic material to landfill, mm. and the rest of the country is following suit. So the national waste strategy, I think it's by 2027, no more organic, not just sewage sludge. Any organic waste is going to go to landfill. So that's going to promote and encourage people to start using anaerobic digestion processes that would uh, produce all this gas that they can use. Maybe another thing I must add is we were involved with certain uh, municipalities. They won't allow any circuit waste or any fence waste or anything like that. So this is perfect for that sort of Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and quite rightly so, if the soil conditions are going to allow for this rapid percolation of the of the water away because you're going to contaminate your groundwater. Yeah. And the coastal regions are well known for that. It's a well documented fact that the soils are readily percolable and so it allows this <coughs> percolation of, of, of the water very quickly. So it's the sandy sandy sand Correct. Coastal, sandy, coastal, coastal yeah. beach sand. Yeah. Yeah. Another question is is it a good idea to put a grease trap in before you discharge it into some of these uh, bio-rock systems? Uh, yes, and not just a bio-rock system, any system, uh, because the fats, oils and greases have got a high organic content, and so that affects your food to microbes and balance that you've got in your process, because the fats, oils and greases is food, so if the food comes through and you haven't got enough bacteria because we haven't designed it, we don't allow fats, oils and grease, not only because of that, but they block pipes, they start putrefying parts and some, so they smell, etc., etc. But yes, you need to remove it. So you need to get prior, prior to the treatment itself. Yes. The and, and so, yes, the approach. Don't have to treat all the water that's arriving at your, at your package plant. Go and find the central kitchen that's producing the fat and put the fat trap behind the kitchen. You don't have to remove the fat oils and greases out the toilets and the ablution box, because that's not where the fat oils and greases are produced. It's in the kitchens, in these big central kitchens, in hospitals, in hotels, etc., uh, etc., et school uh, setups. So it's basically pre, pre treatment though. Correct. It's the remo physical removal of that material. Yeah. And please yeah. remove it and don't discharge it back into the next man on <laughs> downstream. I've seen that often. Yeah. Yes, we enter the, set, the, the fat trap regularly. Where do you take it? Oh, to the next man on and put it down there. Yeah. No, please. That's exactly what happened at Ado Elephant's main <coughs> trap. Or oh, they put a big restaurant. Yes. And there was a fat trap under the zoo, this side. Yeah. So it was completely blocked up everything. Yes. Right through the system, through the ponds. Yeah. On the ponds, it was a layer of fat this thing. And it stings to a high heaven then, because it's sitting in the sunlight and it's rotting. So everything there was blocked up completely. Yeah. So we. We introduced a big new 
full deck. Okay. At the kitchen, just no. outside the kitchen. No. So everything goes through there, so the water coming from that to the system is basically clean. And be mindful of the of the practice in the kitchen because hot water dissociates the fat. Yeah. So it will go through your fat trap yeah. if that water is still hot. Yeah. So yeah. make sure that the fat trap is positioned in a position where the water is cooled down. And don't encourage them to use hot water in the kitchen unless it's cold water. To yeah, that. wash the end basins away. The fat trap that was introduced there was like a three phase outside the kitchen yeah. so the water was cooling down and yes. it started to get there but it, after that it went perfect yeah. good now Peter Brown asked as well is it simple to install or do you need a specialist DIY option for owner, builder or farmer um, so there are DIY options um, I think Eric you might want to come and expand that I'm not that familiar with it I'm not part of the Barrow group <coughs> But I think Eric is the general manager from Bayrock and he can maybe share some of the intended uh, approaches into the market. So I'll step aside and Eric can... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, maybe to start off with the DIY options. Um, what we do as uh, Bayrock, uh, we've got a, a national network of preferred dealers who are able to come out to site and assist, be it a farmer on site with his system that's failing, a biobank dealer will be available to consult with them either in their office or in their home and look at their challenges or be it on site and then advise on an appropriate solution. Um, I'm excited to start off from this side so that we can talk about the different options for different applications. The first one would be the monoblock. This is a compact all-in-one uh, waste water treatment plant supplied with a uh, with a 2,000 litre uh, septic tank, and then next to that we put the treatment plant. And what's, what's unique about the system is the design. Uh, you can see, for example, what, what we're looking at from this end is what we call the effluent brush filter, and this is there to block off any foreign uh, objects from going into the treatment plant to disturb the process. So to ensure that this process is running smoothly, we have the effluent uh, brush in there, and then as Gary indicated earlier on his on his video, we, we saw the pictures of the air coming through the air vent and then going out through the trailer for the ventilation system to work. But then on the other side as well, you've got waste wastewater, complete wastewater from the property. So it's not just for bath and shower water, and then um, um, toilet water must be redirected somewhere else. No. We're not doing that. We're bringing all the wastewater into the septic tank and then the separation process happens and then the water goes on that side. Moving along swiftly, uh, on, for a customer who's, let's say, up a slope uh, on a hill or something like that, the yeah, lady doesn't need uh, what we call a pump to discharge uh, that, that treated water. What he does is he, he will just let it go out or, or flow through a gravity dis discharge, which is then an advantage. Um, if he's up a slope, but then for someone who's in a, call it a flat area, he will then need a pump to lift up the treated, uh, to lift up the treated water to be used for irrigation purposes. So that is really what the monoblock does. Ideally, um, uh, best for for completely new sites. Um, uh, ideally, I, ideally for complete new sites where you are building from scratch, hospitality industry will be mainly for chalets and places like that, whereby the units will be a little bit far away from each other, so then it works better in that scenario. On this other side, we've got what we call the echo hawk, and then this is really retrofitted to a septic tank, mainly for those failing soakaways. Uh, that are out there in the in the in the plots, and what happens is that the poor in the farm will already have a septic tank in there. But because the bylaws and that are enforcing that we walk away from a soak away, then he will then need this kind of a system. In the in the in the Western Cape region, uh, maybe going further to the south coast, we've got we've got a company called Irico that is doing uh, installations and maintenance of such systems. And then coming up from um, from George going towards PE, we we also have a preferred dealer which is 
uh, Forget Engineering, based here in George. So, the reason I mention them is because then, when it comes especially to retrofits, it's not a DIY kind of thing. You don't just do it over the weekend by yourself and try to figure it out. You need um, a specialist who knows how to do that. And then they also come out to site and do call it, uh, regular inspections and maintenance on as per the agreement with the, with the, with the customer. And then on this retrofit side, we've got, so maybe let me just run like there. This is a four to six people kind of a system for domestic application. And then next to that, we've got the echo hook system, which is then um, starts from four up to 30. So you'll have uh, four to six people, and then you'll have 10 people, 15, and then 30 people. Once you get to the 30 people, you can also connect them in a series to go to a maximum of 270 people. However, on projects, we advise that we go up to 90 people. Anything over that, we go to this side of the system, which is uh, the BioRoto RBC, the rotating uh, um, biological contractor. So with this, this now takes care of larger applications, be it your golf courses, your resorts, and again, our, our regional dealers are also available to consult and uh, look at the, um, at the design of that. Also reaching out to us, we are able to assist with that sizing. Uh, we mentioned earlier, we, I, I am available all day to assist with that. My emails are just coming in and then we, we definitely assist with the sizing on that. I'm not sure if there's any question at this stage. As far as this is concerned, just I think just clarify that it can be buried or it can be put on top. Of it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks a for that. Mm -hmm. So it can be installed both the system, so the echo hub monoblock or the biowater system can both be installed, uh, call it underground or above ground, and then this can also be uh, call it semi buried or above ground. And then um, going back to the warranty on the echo hub systems. We, the tank itself is supplied with a 25 year warranty, which is um, first in the market, um, undisputed. Uh, as, as far as quality is concerned, that is an undisputed. And then what we do is that the media bags, uh, that is supplied with a 10 year warranty. But through regular maintenance, through regular inspection with a local dealer in the area, and then uh, this can go beyond that 10 year warranty easily. We've got sites that are over 20 years using the same media as well so you install it and really i know a lot of people want to uh, flush and forget and we enable them to do that as long as there's regular inspection and regular maintenance with that and removal of fat oils and greases and removal of fat oils and greases and maybe one one of the things that i was also mentioned talking about um, um, um maintenance is desludging of the septic tanks when we're using our systems especially the echo hot and the monoblock in most cases, um, this has to be dislodged at least every three to four years versus doing it every second week or every second month and that, which is costly. So cost-wise, this is a better solution as far as the cost is concerned. Yep. Any questions? Uh, yes. What effect, let's say like Nature's Valley, um, they don't have a municipal system there. So if we would like to install a system like this, what effect is it going to have on the good bacteria if it's only a holiday at home and there's only certain times of the year that there's basically food available for the good bacteria? Good question. <laughs> good question. So that's the advantage of the RBC system. Um, remember the discs are rotating in and out of the basin. So we have an organic material that's falling off the discs. It's a mixture of bacteria, food, residual food, and growth so it creates a substrate we like to call it and that stays in suspension in that basin and eventually gets washed up so if the incoming water in an rbc system key feature stops there's enough organic material in the basin itself in that water to sustain it so it's well documented that rbcs can can operate under these fluctuating loads and receive these shock loads because they've always got a, an active biomass in an activated sludge type process you're going to have to adjust your food to microbes and balance and you can't quickly grow the bacteria, it takes 20 days for them to grow. Yeah. So you find in holiday seasons that you, or even weekend and, and in week periods where maybe it's a weekend home and it's not, you have the stop, 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 stop. The bacteria don't like that. So basically if you're on a holiday, 
situation, RBC will keep on rotating even you when you're not there. Correct. You, you need to keep it turning regardless of whether you're there or not. You can also implement a recycle. So even on the Biorock product, we can put in a recycle on any wastewater treatment plant for that matter. We can recycle the water to keep the, the bacteria active. That's yeah. how they need food. They live in organisms. That's how they sustain themselves. Thank the you. challenge with them is that they like to eat all the time. So yeah. <laughs> some of us try, but <laughs> so also to add on what Kevin just mentioned as far as the RBC is concerned, one of the things is that for a single home drilling, um, the system itself can handle long absence per, uh, periods, so it can go up to six months without any activity. But as soon as they come back, flush again, then the process carries on. So the bacteria is not uh, affected in that scenario. As you can see on all our benefits as far as what uh, the features of the product are, and one of them is that it is uh, handling long absence periods. So for a single home somewhere in the bush where I'm only alone, uh, then I will still go with a compact system that I can go for up to six months without any any compromise as far as the process is concerned. Yeah. Thank you. The final water quality that exit there in the final is that uh, I know some of these systems they say that it's river water. They see it as river water, same standard. Uh, so uh, on the bigger ones, definitely. Uh, it'll be better than your river water quality uh, with the tannins in it, I suppose. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it would certainly meet... Um, so the standard is less than 25 suspended solids. So if you've got a drinking water, let me just grab a bottle, uh, and you contemplate this, this is the sort of quality you're going to see because you can't see 25 suspended solids. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. We don't measure suspended solids in drinking water, we measure NTU, turbidity. But it's got a relationship, not a direct relationship. So be careful on that. Don't quote me on that. But we've got a, it's also for for courses, I suppose. So the clarity of the water can be well achieved on both processes, mm. and then some of the dissolved fractions are going to certainly be addressed in the RBC for the larger quantities of water that would require it from a legal point of view. Remember, this is replacing a septic tank at a house. So the septic tank discharge is certainly going to be of an inferior quality to what this can produce. This then allows you to use it on your garden. You can't use septic tank effluent on your garden, it still contains pathogens. So your kids, you are at risk in fact. You put that on your veggie patch and you've got, you know, or the kids go play in the sand and they've got these things under their nail. Would okay, it be, so, so yes, that produces a better quality. Would it be preferable even monoblock or biorotator will to do monthly analysis of water which is available or is it basically foolproof that you, that you can just keep on running it? Well it will be subject to a legal interface. Yeah. Um, all wastewater treatment works of a certain size and I'm not talking about single households because that will probably be a Schedule 1 user in terms of the Water Act and so a Schedule 1 user whether it's a borehole or, or sewage pond or whatever would just have to notify the department of the water use application but they wouldn't have to formally register it with them. Okay. If it's larger, so anything up to 2,000 kilolitres of that, 2,000 megalitres of dirt, sorry, cubes a day, um, would be subject to what we call the general authorisation and the normal terms and conditions that the regulator would enforce is a monthly sample result. That will be part of the conditions for you to be allowed to put a bigger plant in. Yes. <laughs> and so there's a whole list of, of elements that are prescribed in the Water Act to achieve that. And the RBC, men, men, remember I mentioned nitrates, and nitrates not been able to be removed previously because it wasn't enforced. This is taken up in the new design of it. With uh, especially now for household um, usage, maybe, um, with regards to putting it into the system, would you recommend rather using biodegradable soaps? Uh, would that be a great advantage for any septic system? For any for any good practice application, yes, we should be using biodegradable material, environmentally friendly uh, stuff. It's the same with foodstuffs. Unfortunately, they cost more money for 
for the reason that the retailers need to tell us, I suppose. We try and promote being environmentally friendly, eating health food, but at the end of the day, it's not always affordable to everyone, unfortunately. But certainly, biodegradable material will assist with minimizing your impact of your discharges. Remember, in a, in a small household application, you haven't got the luxury of a reticulation to dilute that. So handy Andy is an ammonia-based cleaning agent. So if you get too excited in your cleaning, in your spring clean, and you squeeze too much handy Andy in your bath basin and you clean it, and it's all nice and clean and shiny, because that's the words, pumped in handy Andy, I suppose. But then where does that go? Through the discharge pipe of your bath, straight through the wall to your, your plant. And if that comes through in a high concentration, the bugs are going to go, oh, too much food for us to eat, we'll have to pass. And so some of that food passes then, and that means your final effluent quality is compromised, because that's the residual food is going out the back end of the wastewater plant. So be mindful of those applications, and that's the interface that Eric's alluding to, that the dealers in the network would engage and provide you with support and give you a list of recommended cleaning agents, etc. Et um, is there on your website a list of that cleaning agents? I don't think it's on the website, no. But we can make it available through emails. Yeah. No, no other questions? Yes, so if there's no other questions, uh, thank you for coming tonight and thank you for lodging into the stream the youtube live streaming and we say goodbye thank you for coming out and we just encourage some feedback in terms of what they felt about the presentation oh yes yes if they can put it in the chat uh, we'll put all the questions i see we didn't uh, deal with all the questions but uh, i'll send it through to you and you can correspond by email perfect thank you very much thank you, thank you. Thank you.